Um, that's a great question. So um, I think there's often a trade-off compared to if you want to do the top level of security or um, too much security that's actually kind of blocking the actual development work. So, uh, to find the right balance, it really depends on the different organization and their requirement of their security level. For example, you can have some mature unit test to make sure all of the functions are covered and integration test, end-to-end -end test. So after you upgrade the dependency, you have this different testing level and then you can make sure all if all of these tests are, are passed, that probably mm -hmm. means we're safe to do this a major upgrade and on the other side if their dependencies are doing um, have only minor upgrades to fix some vulnerabilities but it's not actually breaking changes it's probably mm -hmm. safer to do um, to do that um, straight away welcome to the elephant in AppSec, the podcast to explore challenge and boldly face the AppSec elephants in the room I'm Alexander, your host and AppSec enthusiast and growth manager at Escape, an API discovery and security platform. Today, my guest is Kaiwen Jiang, an application security engineer at a financial services company in the UK. Her primary areas of focus are vulnerability management, threat modeling, and security training. She was previously a cybersecurity consultant at Deloitte as well. Kaiwen also runs the blog AppSec Kiki, where she shares her knowledge with the community and she's an active participant in London's OWASP community meetups. Quick special announcement for the Elephant and AppSec. In November, we're hosting the first Elephant and AppSec virtual conference. Join us and hear from speakers who aren't afraid to share their strong opinions. But now, back to this episode. In the first episode of Season 2, Kaiwen shared her insights on why open source security in the supply chain has become such a hot topic this year. She also shared how to evaluate the risk of open source software, how to prioritize unit tests. We also discussed the importance of asset management, how she transitioned to a developer role for a time to better understand what prevents developers from fixing vulnerabilities in their release cycles. And there is so much more. This episode is perfect for anyone who wants to dive into application security and learn more about getting started in the field. So let's dive right in. Hi, Kainan. Thanks uh, a lot for coming on the podcast. Uh, actually, I think this episode is going to open the season two of uh, the podcast. I'm very excited to about it and I'm very excited to, to have you on, uh, on board with us. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, finding the time and uh, joining us. And uh, so uh, today, I think our main topic is going to be the open source uh, security. I think it's one of the topics you've uh, like, and you also one of the topics that is now actually very popular. Like I think on uh, Tuesday, I've been at uh, the CodeTech uh, conference, and at that it was like the keynote, uh, basically what started with this, uh, with literally this, like open source and supply chain security, and uh, reminding you know, everyone like what happened with Exit Backdoor, and uh, yeah, so it's a, I think it's a kind of like a very top, hot topic right now because the whole like conference is about that. I don't know why, and. Uh, <laughs> Why do you personally think, you know, from your experience that it's, uh, you know, such a big topic? Yeah, um, thank you, Alexandra, for having me. And I'm really excited to be here. So for, um, I think it's a really, as you said, it's a hot topic and a really interesting as well. So I think as as a developer um, on their daily life, they're just to use countless different kind of open source software and then some of them just uh, can be um, outdated um, some of them have some own critical vulnerabilities but never get updated and so mm. the impact of them can be quite critical and um, if those are get overlooked um, mm -hmm. because of the impact um, we want to make sure people have uh, awareness to make sure those are um, dependencies are taking in, into consideration when they look into the security perspective. Some of them, as you mentioned, like X, XDET and Backdoor are like uh, quite widespread um, vulnerability as well. Um, yeah, we just want to make sure people are aware of that. And um, also some of the attacks are quite complex yeah. and um, yeah, um, it can be just part of any of the supply 
supply chain uh, as part of the target. Um, we just want to um, make sure all of them um, from a developer perspective are being considered when um, doing the develop development work. Yeah, I think so in application security, like this relationship, you know, with developers and actually watching what they're doing is super important. And I think, yeah, it happens, especially, you know, when, uh, uh, when the speed of the development is just so fast and uh, just updates, updates all the time, especially like, you know, in the modern application, like uh, modern application, it yeah. just goes so, so fast. So you have to kind of find this, you know, trade off between uh, the speed of development, like how fast everything gets shipped because yeah, the it's important for the business and actually, you know, finding the time to fix things, like fix mm -hmm. the bugs, you know, which happen <laughs> as well. So, you know, how do you, what would you recommend, you know, for people, for the listeners, like to balance this properly, like the balance, you know, the business needs and uh, like actual fixing vulnerabilities. Yeah, um, there is really a, a crucial part, um, which is regulatory and compliance pressure. To like for uh, for example, if businesses are doing financial services and it, there are certain requirements, especially for different local markets, they have different requirements for you to pass, and uh, some of them just have this mandatory requirement to um, mitigate the. Um, Soft, uh, software, uh, third-party software, reg uh, regularly okay. um, update, patch, and then they want to see how you mitigate this process. And uh, this kind of enforce the um, organization to look into this um, to start with. And uh, also, as I mentioned before, um, we want to make sure the uh, engineering team have this security awareness um, in place to to know that when they doing the um, application designing to uh, until all the way to the operation level, the security uh, aspect are taking into consideration along the way. Yeah, um, well, I'm curious. Like you mentioned, local regulations. Like what local regulations do you have in the UK? Um. So one of the common ones for the for the Europe is GDPR. Okay. And uh, the, uh, for financial services, you have PCI DSS, and uh, there are, there are some other ones. Uh, Singapore has their own ones. Australia has their own mm. regulations and things like that. Okay, yeah, PCI DSS. I think it's something that's for sure yeah. <laughs> for financial industry. It's like uh, you must uh, fulfill it, especially with the you know four point oh. Uh, uh, that's that's now yeah coming and uh, that's I think next year from starting from next beginning of next year it must be in place so now everyone is just yeah kind of ready uh, for that but yeah it's an important uh, you know part of uh, of the security like actually like yeah security in general but uh, if you get more you know into technical side of things since we're talking you know about developments and developers like. I know uh, personally, like sometimes I don't do like a lot anymore, a lot of like development. I think usually it's more like, very high level, you know, like modifying a markdown or, uh, you know, opening a pull, uh, like opening pull requests on GitHub very rarely, you know, and I understand that, yes, yeah, some, sometimes I force <laughs> for this pull request, I actually do, you know, it's also uh forcing there but i understand like if i would have done you know something a bit more maybe serious than uh more down it could have introduced you know security risks or like breaking changes and uh over at uh at the status cable we're quite serious about that and everything gets you know verified uh, by other team member but you know for more complex cases do you think like yeah the efficiency gain sometimes like for me, is it worth like potential security risk? Do you think, for example, for me, I also like have to kind of ask someone to verify <laughs> what I'm what I'm kind of forcing? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So um, I think there's often a trade off compared to if you want to do the top level of security or mm -hmm. um, too much security that's actually kind of blocking the actual development work. So to find the right balance, it really depends on 
the different organization and their requirement of their security level. Um, okay. For example, if they are doing the healthcare industry, then obviously they want to uh, make sure the patient's data are absolutely safe to be stored somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, be taken care of um, compared to other industry. So um, with that in mind, and yeah. it's also uh, from a developer perspective, we want to improve the maturity of the testing level. So okay. for after that, you will know, um, for example, you can have some um, mature unit test to make sure all of the functions are covered and integration test, end-to-end -end test. So after you upgrade the dependency, you have this different testing level and then you can make sure all if all of these tests are, are passed, that probably mm -hmm. means we're safe to do this uh, major upgrade. Okay. And on the other side, if their dependencies are doing, um, have only minor upgrades to fix some vulnerabilities, but it's not actually breaking changes, it's probably mm -hmm. safer to do, um, to do that, um, straight away, um, compared to the major breaking, uh, breaking, breaking upgrades. Okay. So yeah, overall, if you want to do a ma major upgrade, just to make sure you test it properly before you actually deploy the change to production. Okay. And where would you draw the line? Because like you mentioned, at yeah, top level and uh, yeah, like breaking changes, I mean, probably for me, it's going to be different <laughs> from, for you. So where would you like draw the line between something like important and less important? Um, that depends. Um like to help with the prioritize, it depends on organization as well. Um, okay. It depends on the senior management uh, yeah. management group for there to decide. But overall, to help prioritizing, we can, uh, uh, we can, there are certain things we can have a look, okay. the severity of the certain vulnerabilities, we can see the CVE reference, and then they have, they have this mm. CVSS score to help us to yeah. understand if it's a critical vulnerability with high impact. Mm. And also there are some other aspects to see if this vulnerability has a mitigation um mitigation method available already so that we know um, the vulnerability can be fixed mm -hmm. after we upgrade to a certain version. Also, there is another aspect that we, um, from developer, they, they can verify if this vulnerability is actually the real vulnerability for us, uh, as, okay. aka as, as like false positive. False positive, yeah. Yes. Um, that needs some teamwork together to verify the to decide if this really is not something impact us and then we can ignore and mm. yeah things to these are um, basically the things you need to consider when going to prioritize okay yeah yeah and when you do testing like there are a lot of tools you know that uh, you can implement some of them like have negative buzz you know a high fault false positives rate, some have actually, some are good. And you know, when they met uh, before the podcast, you mentioned that you love Trivy, you know, you that you really love uh, using it. So it, it is open source tool. So when we're talking yeah, about you know, open source tool and open source tools and actual vulnerabilities in those open source tools and no tool, you know, is perfect, I think. Everyone has kind of the definition of their perfect tool in application security <laughs> that usually ask, but no to existing tool, you know, is perfect. And how do you, for example, check that the tool, you know, that you are using, especially if it's open source and everyone, you know, contr can contribute at any moment that it's secure? That's a really good question. So the reason why I like I like trivia is because it's coverage. So some of um, um, when I did the market research about the container uh, security scanner for Docker mm -hmm. image, for example, um, okay. there were not much tooling um, in the market, and then trivia just stand out that way. Um, also, mm -hmm. it can detect the Kubernetes and operating system level uh, vulnerabilities. That's how I think. Um, it's a good tool to use um, compared to other commercial and non-commercial open source tools. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting you mentioned about how do we make sure um, this tool is safe to use. Okay. Um, in short, um, we just uh, regularly mm -hmm. update and patch Trivi um, itself as a, uh, as a tooling. 
Okay. And uh, um, conduct some internal internal reviews to make sure things are working as it's supposed to do. And, okay. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's what we're we're doing right now. But there are certainly some area to um to be improved. That, for example, maybe we can do a um auto configuration testing to see if there's mm. any um new feature get introduced or um vulnerability fixed from the tool itself, for example. Um, but yeah, that that's uh, what I'm thinking so far. Okay. So did you personally, you know, contribute as well to the to the Not tool? at the moment, but I think it's something yeah. I should to, to look into um in the future. Yeah. So yeah. you really, really inspired me. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh you know especially if you if that's something that you like and you know you already understand, you know, the pain points personally. Yeah. Uh, I think then you can potentially contribute, you know, it can be like a small contribution. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, technically, I did not <laughs> contribute the open source tools at the moment, but I've done uh, like more compass open source, like uh, libraries or, you know, awesome lists that I'm trying to do, uh, you know, from, uh, from time, uh, from time to time. And like speaking also about tooling in general, you know, I think through the last three weeks when I've tried to, you know, so talk with more engineers and I've met some in, uh, in London as well. And I think almost literally every single one of them mentioned to me that they do not like Snake. Uh, so it might be, I, I love to you know on the podcast, I love controversial questions. So what is, is your personal opinion about that? So it's a really good one, actually. Um, I was a customer of Snake uh, in the past couple of years and uh, until, until recently. Um, I joined my current comp- uh, the current company, so I've ch- I've seen how much Snake gets involved evolved mm-hmm. from their functionality level, and I know that um, yeah, the first time I got introduced to Snake was August twenty twenty, and then back then there were not a lot of the tooling on the market to do the mm-hmm. software composition analyst, and that's when Snake st- stood out. And okay. then it just uh, expanded more and more and more. And I say the pricing just increased so much since then okay. um, compared to the quality. And uh, as I mentioned, like an uh, open source tool like Trivi is probably not too much um, differentiation. Yeah. Um, so there is um, a discussion that if Sneak worth the money we're paying for compared okay. to the the. Um, testing quality and results we receive from open source tool and that is still a question mark in my opinion mm. um and also i think um, when do when using sneak it, it it is great that it has a beautiful interface it has uh, jira integration you can just automate it straight away and um, by in, uh, creating the jira ticket for certain vulnerabilities but also oftentimes i see there are a lot of duplicates for the same production. For example, um, there's, this is one product, but I'm, I'm doing two releases, and then maybe uh, Sneaky will just report same vulnerabilities for different tags. And then for um, the team owner, they might just feel like the, why there's a certain, a certain increase for the vulnerability, but it's actually not actual vulnerability, it's just duplicates. Yeah. So yeah, I think that this is the, mean job back based on my experience and yes. pricing obviously and yeah. yeah so they just create kind of more vulnerabilities to f- let you feel like you have more value for the money <laughs> you pay but in the end <laughs> you know um, I guess, yeah, that's, yes yeah um, i think it was a great tool um to begin with uh, but i haven't i haven't used it since uh, since 2023 so i'm not sure how it is now maybe they improved maybe they're not <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't seen like anyone being in love with it, so <laughs> I don't know if uh, it improved. I personally do not use it, so I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't judge. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, would you then prefer more open source tools, despite you know maybe potential drawbacks, so uh, or uh, maybe sometimes also like security drawbacks in some sense? Like, would you still firstly 
look at the open source tools and then commercial tools or would you try to compare both kind of at the same time? So when I do a market research, I'm quite open minded on both sides mm -hmm. and uh, I'm always interested to learn how this commercial tool come out, um, like what's yeah. the base of it. And then, yeah, it's quite interesting. There's one time I talked to a commercial tooling vendor and then it told me this is the tool they built on top of an open source tool. And then okay. some actual filter yeah. to make it look better, but you know, it's from the open source tool. So yeah. I, I wouldn't just shut the door for and because it's open source or it's because of the uh, commercial tool. For me, uh, what I prioritize the most is actually mm -hmm. the, the, the quality of the tooling scanning. If um, it supports the language we're using and it comes back with quite extensive results and it's easy to use to in implement, then I don't think it, it matters if it's open source or not. Um, okay. As long as yeah. we we take precaution, like make sure it's upgraded, um, updated uh, regularly, and you go, you went through the internal audit when doing the op tooling onboarding, I think you should be okay. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you do not feel a bit cheated when you ask like a lot of money for basically a wrapper of an open source yeah, exactly. <laughs> tool. Yeah. Yeah. I think it happens. Uh, yeah, it happens for desk tool, for example. But uh, yeah, was was up. <laughs> That gets rapid because I personally like know this uh the stories that you know I've heard uh on uh, on the market. And uh, I think uh, during your uh, presentation that I've saw at OVASP London meetup, you mentioned as well uh like defect dojo, right? That you're using like to centralize vulnerability uh management. So uh, for you, you know, the those kind of tools they can kind of create a single, you know point of failure in a sense as well so how do you for example uh, in your experience you know mitigate those risks associated with the uh, centralization yeah that's a really really good question so so far on my experience i don't see defect dojo fail because um, we can mm. just download all the all of the source and then we just customize and for our, our use um it doesn't really matter how um defect dojo um repository update or not we have our own code on that front and on top okay. of it on top of it we have our own dashboard to see um so that we can see the vulnerability chance and then mm -hmm. even if defect order is down on our side we still have backup data for all of the vulnerabilities and then um the engineers are still able to accept um, access those data and vulnerabilities and on top of that um, okay. developers can still use the uh, the Trivi or any other um, scanners to scan the vulnerabilities on their local um, locally so that they don't miss much um, on that. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the things that we're doing at the moment. Okay, so would you recommend to someone to create those backups of uh, vulnerabilities like all the time? Or is it something that you know you've just done as a thing and uh, you don't necessarily maybe see the benefit from it? So um, personally, I think I would recommend any user who mm -hmm. use Defect Dojo to create a backup at least uh, daily so that we can keep the trends. And also is kind of um, auditing requirement. Um, okay. If the regulator want to see how do we uh, take care of the uh, open source vulnerabilities, and then there are there are the dashboard we can show them. And um, for Defect Dojo, um, is it has similar effect, but we want to keep it open to ourselves, uh, ourselves only. You know, the vulnerabilities mm. we don't want everyone to see that. Okay, <laughs> I mean. I'm sure every company, you know, doesn't want everyone to see their vulnerabilities yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. Uh, yeah, there is compliance stuff. There is also hacker potential, you know. Uh, yeah. So yeah, some things for sure you want to, uh, you know, keep for yourself. And um, like yeah, in the beginning, you know, for the conversation we were speaking as well about you know the developers and. Uh, um, if, if and now about the vulnerabilities so how do you make sure that, that you know the developers actually fix what's being uh you know found yeah. and uh hidden you know on your side <laughs> yeah sure so um back to a few years ago when i just started to look into vulnerabilities i 
didn't know anything. So I was like, oh, there are a hundred vulnerabilities. I talked to a developer. Um, your team has a hundred vulnerabilities, and this is SLA you need to fix with. This is um. I'm just not talking about like a real case. I'm just pretending. Okay. <laughs> and then yeah. you need to fix them in in seven days. And then they're like, "Why am I doing this? I have a a new release and a, a really tight yeah. timeline. I need to focus on. I don't have time extra time to look into this. So I I have to push it back. I'm sorry. So I'm like, okay. So uh, after this release cycle, I'm I'm talking to them again. So. There are a hundred vulnerabilities. You have three days. You need to fix them. They're like, oh, I have an, an, another release cycle. I have to push it back again. Yeah. So in the end, they it's just endless. never look into this. The vulnerabilities are just existing forever. And so I want you to understand why this is happening. So I changed my role to developer for, okay. for a while, and I, I so yeah. that I can really understand uh, what's their priority yeah. and why they trying to push it back for the security perspective. I think there are two main points based on my experience. One is their lack of security awareness. They are not. They don't understand the important um, to setting up an SLA for uh, vulnerability fixing, yeah. and uh, they don't. They don't understand. Um, yeah basically the impact if they don't fix um, what might happen. So security awareness training is crucial and is needed. And then the other part is, if it's an easy fix, like um, a minor version jump, you just change the number and then just deploy, it's easy like that. But it's not always like that. If, like, as we dis like we discussed before, it can be a break breaking change and then it needs a lot more work than just uh, change the number. Developers are reluctant to do that. Um, on that front as well. So to help them, I um, they can use some tools like a Dependabot, Renovate. They can automatically yeah. raise PRs, and so um, also help them to really prioritize the the vulnerability severities. Mm -hmm. So um, for example, the tooling might say this vulnerability is a uh, critical level. Yeah. But it might not actually is compared to how it was introduced in your service and how the service is getting your used. For example, if this service is internal only and the customer can't interact with it directly, then the severity pro probably is not as high as it is due because the impact wouldn't be that much. So we want to re refactor the vulnerability severity adjustment to make sure mm -hmm. what um, the severity really reflects what it matters for us um, as a service owner. And also, okay. also um, to using the tools like um, automating tools to uh, auto upgrading the dependencies. And okay. um, I can, as I mentioned before, um, improve the testing, testing strategy so that they are more comfortable with the version upgrade. Okay, and how do you educate yourself or know what's critical for the business? Because you mentioned yeah, you adjust, you know, the yeah. score. How yeah. do you like you? Uh, yeah, say you I join think, the company. How yeah, do you sure. know? I think again, this this is not a formula like one fit all size. It still needs to be to be discussed case by case. But in general, mm. there are a couple of aspects you want to consider. For example, um, if it, this endpoint is public facing if it in interacts okay. with customer and also if this vulnerability is public exploitable some of the critical mm -hmm. vulnerabilities are not exploitable yet so you still have some yeah. time to get it fixed how um, much time it, dep it depends but still you want okay. to prioritize it but still like if there's no mitigation available for an uh, open source tool there is still mm. not much you can do. You can contact the to the third party owner and ask them there's a vulnerability, mm -hmm. please can you fix it? But it's there are some restrictions over there. Um that's the other aspect we want to consider. Mm. Okay. And uh, yeah, that that's basically um what I would recommend to think about in general. Um if it's public facing, if it's public exploitable. If there, if it's mitigation available, um, yeah. Okay. And what about you know, like developer? So you understand, like on your side, business risk, but in the end, developers do not really understand all those risks. Let's say there's a new person, you know, who comes on board, and they want to uh, dev uh, build a project, and they have this they want to build it on the top of, let's say, open source tool. 
Uh, do you usually like keep track of all of those uh, tools used and check them for security or uh, how does it work? So when a new new person join join the company, we have this mandatory um, training for them to to learn and um, okay. secure coding secure coding um, practice so that they have to complete the training and pass a certain score to make sure uh, they understand it. And hmm. after that, um, they start. Does everyone pass? Yeah, they have to pass it. Otherwise, oh yeah, okay. I can just mention it. So to make sure everyone pass this training, hmm. we also like enforce this. Um, if the person is not um, finished, complete the training with certain score within the, uh, the due date of the course, they are blocked from merger PRs. Well, okay. Yeah. So it's very uh, hit and miss and um, yeah. Yeah. So we don't, we don't want to enforce that, but you know, people just keep ignoring us and it's quite important as part of the re regulatory mm. requirements. And we want to also make sure uh, our engineers are properly educated from a security perspective. Okay. Did it uh, produce any, you know, uh quarrels internally ever that you get like now you can't merge this PR anymore and then they were so angry so they have to check, complete the training because they have okay. they had enough time and uh, I think they uh, it's like two months uh, hmm. window for them to complete so okay. not, not yet yeah okay. and on the application security side of things you know when a new person joins what would you recommend them uh, to to do or to learn um you mean uh, a new person want to join the application security field yeah the application security i think maybe we can you know divide this part like or for uh, let's say a new person wants to uh, join a uh, financial industry like sector what do you think they need to learn and then uh, we can yeah, talk about you know Entire like someone a very newbie, let's say. Well, I'm I'm not like working directly to the financial service part, hmm. um, but the product is financial service. So I think if uh, a person want to join um in the like as a security professional, first of all they want to make uh, they want to try uh, as much as possible. There are so many different aspects in in cybersecurity. Mm. It doesn't have to be restricted to to application security. There are tons of different fields like um, cloud security, mm. instant response, security operations. There are so many more. And for a new person and especially in early careers, I I would strongly recommend them to try different things different projects and mm. read and learn as much as possible so that they know what it is exactly it's for and then i, I think only after you tried um then you will have a better understanding if that's something you're interested um and then you can look into some relevant um certificates or um, contribute on some open source project is something i need yeah. to do as well <laughs> Um, <laughs> next next steps <laughs> yeah i think that that that's that's how you get started yeah yeah i think there are some areas of security you know that still are a bit like hot uh you know i think like cloud security or application security they're definitely i don't know at least in my opinion much fun more fun than SOC analyst <laughs> something like that but, yeah that's my I personal totally agree to be honest well yeah. there's there's one thing i know as a sock analyst is that you probably need to be there um 24 7 if you're on call just in case if there's any incident happen um i feel quite privileged that i, I never have to do that <laughs> i'm not sure cross, yeah cross the fingers i think yeah it's only in the case you know breach happens i guess yeah then uh, it's a little bit more uh, tough yeah. Uh, but yeah not uh, not the same <laughs> for sure <laughs> and uh, i always ask us this question at the end of the podcast if there would be a book that you would like to recommend or a learning resource to someone uh, who is just you know starting in application security what would it be so that's the book i would recommend for anyone to read is the 
I'm I'm studying the CISSP recently, and I find、okay. this book, this study guide guide is really helpful. I wish I knew it earlier. So even though you are not studying for the certificate, it still provide quite a lot of fundamental knowledge in the、uh, not only application security but also cyber security as a whole.、Mm. Um, some um fundamental concept and how would you think um. For、uh, approaching certain problems, so it it has been quite beneficial to me. Let me find out what is that thing、okay. this name. Yeah, I can put.、Uh, you know, you can send it to to me the link afterwards, and I can put it in the description、yeah. uh, later of the of the episode. But I'm curious, why did you start to、uh, to get ready? You know, for SSSP. Like, why did you decide to go for this、uh, certification? Yeah, it's yeah. The book is basically this this SSSP study guide. So,、okay. um, I've. Been doing cybersecurity for around over six years, and、mm. I think for me to move up a bit and、uh, um, CISSP is a great certification to have, and especially、okay. when I check some companies、um, as management level or as a team lead level,、um, the、uh, the certificate is required as preferred and like nice to、okay. have. So I think. Having this would help me to advance a bit further in my own career progression, and okay. uh, uh, especially I have been here,、uh, been in this field for、uh, a couple of years already. I think it's a great time、mm. for me to do that.、Um, okay, and do do you think you're learning a lot while you're preparing for the certification, or it's more like you need to have it to advance? <laughs> I definitely learned learned a lot. So、mm. I I did a degree for information security when I was in at Royal Holloway for master degree,、mm-hmm. and I think some of the content are kind of overlapping, but、okay. uh, you know it's a lot cheaper when compared to doing a certificate compared to doing、yeah. a degree. Okay. And also for,、sure. for me, it's some、uh, it's reminding me what I've studied, and some of them is like I should I can use it in my daily life, but.、Mm. I just simply forgot. <laughs> so by、okay. reading it, it helps it helps me to re、um, structure my own knowledge level, and、uh, mm. I can have a clearer structure on my daily work as well. Okay, interesting. And what's yeah, the also most... there are some other、yeah. aspects like、um, security operations is not something I'm super familiar with, and、mm. it pro- provides some、um, induction as well, and some aspect、okay. like、uh, how would you do. Disaster recovery. How would you think about、mm. asset management? That those are the area I think currently outside of my scope, but I、mm. think it's quite beneficial to learn anyway. Yeah, I think especially yeah, asset management. I would say that's super important because you need to kind of know all the assets、yeah. that you have. You know, on an organizational level, I guess you can't even you know approach the security、yeah. and how to make sure you actually can. Maintain, yeah.、Uh, this kind of yeah, yeah, inventory. It can also help prioritizing. You know which asset、mm. is quite is the most important, and then we can prioritize from security level. Those security level need to be the highest, and then、okay. yeah. For um, for example, so um, the top cri- cri- uh, cri- uh, critical assets need to be in the highest security level. So then,、mm. only ha- limited people. Uh, absolutely necessary need to access to the service can be like for the、um, access management level and the crypto level and different、mm. other aspects as well. So I think、okay. yeah, as we, um, I agree, asset management is quite important to to know. What would be the assets you know that would be top critical level? It is out of my scope. Okay, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure yet, but um. If um if I was a a customer of a financial service, obviously I would care the most about my personal data and my money. So my money is my、yeah. most important、um, to look at. I want to know where where it is, where uh, and uh, if it's safe enough to be able to give over、um, to to this yeah.、Um, service. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you're hiding it, you, you know, from the tech services. I <laughs> want the whole world to know suddenly. How、yeah. much you you have, I guess. Yeah.、Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, for coming on the podcast. It was really interesting、uh, conversation, and、uh, had a lot of、uh, a lot of fun. 
thank you uh, for finding the time. It was uh, it was great. Great. Thank you for for having me again, Alexandra. I really enjoy the talk, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.